I heard this van was going to be here, and I found it. It's MCOM 1. We're going to take a look inside. I got these two guys here, though, that are, that are going to tell me what it is I'm looking at. We've got our friend Ray Novak from ICOM America here with us. Hi, Ray. Hello, George, and everybody out there. Good to see you here, and good to be in Huntsville, even though it's a little bit wet. It is, it is quite a little bit wet out there right now, and we've got uh, another friend here. This is Mike. And what's your last name? Lee, L-E-E. -E. Mike Lee, and you're with, um, uh, tell us what organization you're with. I'm with uh, Flagler County Emergency Management, and uh, I'm also a ham, uh, like the rest of you. And uh, we've built this vehicle basically to support public safety. Of course, you can't have just a public safety vehicle. You have to have, have uh, amateur radio equipment as well because they're a lot of times the eyes and ears uh, for public safety, just like uh, having GMRS capability and MERS and FRS and everything else. So this is a county in Florida? This is uh, the county just north of Daytona Beach, Flagler County, and uh, we're actually out of Palm Coast, Florida. So then the folks down there know very well ham radio plays a big part in emergency communications. They do indeed. In fact, uh, Flagler County was the first county in the state of Florida to be certified by the National Weather Service for Skywarn. Uh, we're called a um, Skywarn or Weather Ready uh, County. And uh, we probably have on the order of about 100, 125 weather spotters just within our county, which is fairly small. Uh, North-south, uh, distance of about uh, maybe 12, 12 and a half miles, east-west of about uh, 15. So just out of that small area, 125, between amateur radio and GMRS. So very, very active because we get a lot of storms, obviously, uh, being on the coast. Well, let's take a look around the vehicle. I'm going to tap into both of y'all to, to tell me what it is I'm looking at because I don't know all the land mobile stuff and, y you know, any of that gear. I recognize some of the names in here, and I recognize some of the gear in here too, but not all of it. So where do where do we actually start? There are a lot of radios in this van. All right. Well, we're going to give you a little bit of light in this area, George. The first one here is a Land Mobile radio that is uh, Part 80 certified, so it can be used as a marine base station. Right next to it is the ICV 8000. Uh, it's not powered up right now in this configuration. And that's an amateur radio. Yes, that is an amateur radio, 2 meter, 75-watt uh, 2 meter radio. Then right next to it that has the number 903 right above it is a aviation mobile. Then we have two of our uh, P25, our 9511s set up. Program, Mike? Uh, this one is uh, programmed as VHF, so we have, uh, as an example, all of the Florida Forestry Service uh, frequencies on it. We've got uh, a number of other, such as uh, railroad frequencies on it. We've got GMR, excuse me, MERS on it, on VHF. And then, of course, um, we're authorized to use it for uh, amateur, too, if, if we need to. Then next to it is a UHF version, kind of a twin, if you will. Uh, this is programmed for uh, a number of things, not the least of which is GMRS, because we have a very large active GMRS community for our CERT teams. And it's also programmed for SARNET, which is a little bit unusual uh, within the state of Florida in that the state DOT, Department of Transportation, uh, encouraged HAMS to have UHF repeaters linked using their fiber optic and microwave network. So it's the backup to the backup for DOT actually serves a really interesting purpose because it serves as DOT's way to monitor their microwave links. Uh, since the amateurs are using it and if they find that they can't get into SARNET, then it's probably something either to do with the repeater or to the microwave links. Then down here below the V8000, we have an IC7100 body and then a body for our F8101, which is our commercial HF product. Then to it is a communications console with two ID5100s right above it. And then a couple of control heads for those two HF radios that we just saw. The F8101 
is an ALE compatible HF radio. It's 150 watts, a little bit larger body, more heat dissipation, and then the 7100 right next to it. That 8101 is a little bit unique as well. Um, we use it primarily for our low band frequencies for which we're licensed, as well as the ability to communicate to the feds using the shares network. So because of that, this unit is also authorized for DES encryption, obviously something you can't do on part 97 on the amateur bands. Then next below the, uh, the amateur radios, we've got a couple of things. This one is a satellite system, but unlike normal satellite telephone, this one's rather unique. It's called MSAT. It's used by every county in the state of Florida. And in fact, in many states throughout the U.S., including Hawaii, uh, Puerto Rico, as well as uh, Alaska, of course. And what's unique is that it has not just the normal cell cellular telephone-like facilities, but this unit provides us push-to-talk with different talk groups that are programmed in into the unit. So now we have satellite capability with push-to-talk. And we'll talk about why that's important a little bit later because one of the purposes of this uh, vehicle is to be able to bridge different kinds of RF, uh, both on the marine side, the airband side, the Part 90 side, and if necessary, the Part 97 side as well. Below that, some of you might recognize if you're in public safety, a Zetron panel. This is a tone generation. We use it for dispatch, and this is a uh, capability where if we lost our trunking system, we would be able to dispatch to our uh, volunteer firefighters. Uh, we use VHF paging, two-tone paging, so this will generate the two-tone pages to this VHF radio uh, in analog narrowband mode. Below that's just a simple Windows 7 computer. Next to that here is a Green Heron rotator controller. Uh, you saw the uh, the mast outside. We've got a tail twister up there. And right now we have a um, 20 through 6 meter hex beam uh, from radio waves. And uh, we chose them not because of the amateur side per se, but they're the only ones that make custom antennas. So they actually make a hex beam where we can have federal frequencies, different length wires, of course. Uh, and we can operate L ALE and have a two-element directional with a really good front-to-back ratio for a non-amateur antenna. Rather unique. And for our purposes, very important because we need to be able to communicate, for example, with uh, State of Florida Tallahassee Emergency Operations Center, as well as, uh, for example, if we were supporting uh, a hurricane uh, incident in Miami. Uh, which is about uh, 250 miles away. Right. We, we keep hearing uh, a fan kick in and out, and you got a real elaborate uh, power distribution system down below. Power distribution as well as onboard power um, and external power as well. Down on the bottom here, we have uh, 400 amp hours of AGM uh, battery. We're using batteries from Lifeline. We specifically selected those as opposed to wet cells or other AGM providers because Lifeline batteries are, are used by the U.S. Air Force in their F-16 fighters exclusively. So they are G-proof. You can operate them in any, uh, any mode or orientation. And uh, so we've got 400 amp hours of, of battery. On top of that, here we've got a 2,000 watt inverter charger. So obviously, if we're operating off battery power, we don't have shore power or generator backup. Uh, we can operate, for example, our computer here, and we've got a couple of other accessories that are AC only. Virtually everything, though, on this vehicle, because we need it for deployment, is 12 volt. So all of the radios are 12 volt. Um, all of the telephone systems are 12 volt. All the bridging controllers are 12 volt. And that was important to us because we need to be able to operate off battery power for some period of time until we're able, for example, to connect the generator, get it started, etc. So as soon as we arrive on scene, uh, after we've been dispatched, we want to be operational at least to be able to start bridging radios and controllers. Um, 
it, it does take us a little bit of time, as you saw the crank up mast outside. Uh, it cranks up to 31 feet with a couple of extensions above the tail twister rotator. But realistically, to put that up, to put the hex beam up, to put VHF, UHF antennas, and 800 megahertz antennas takes us about 90 minutes. So we don't want to wait until we're operational with those antennas. We want to be able to use the roof mount antennas with battery power. George, as you look through here, you see a lot of lot of tightly bundled wires. Everything's behind, bundled together nicely. But if you look up higher, you're going to see all these raw wires out here. Do you have any idea why we do that? Uh, I would say because... You want to be prepared in an emergency that you can rewire this thing to, to operate completely differently. Wow, he read the script, didn't he, Mike? Uh, he was pretty good. Um, the real reason is very, very close. Uh, we actually leave these open just for demonstration purposes. So when we were at APCO earlier this week, um, on Monday, Tuesday, we use this to be able to show people that we don't have two things. Number one, you know, you don't see anything here that's flush mount like you do on a lot of public safety vehicles. And the philosophy there was very intentional in that if something's flush mount, you're not going to want to change it because you're going to have to cut a new panel and everything else. Uh, similarly here, if this was all behind some very, very elaborate flush mounting, you wouldn't want to change the wiring either. And that's contrary to what we wanted to do. This vehicle, uh, the vehicle itself is 12 years old, but it's constantly over the years changed missions, it's changed equipment. A uh, great example, just recently in the last 10 weeks, we got some new P25 capable equipment. Prior to that, we had some previous generation equipment. We want to be able to swap it quickly, rewire it really quickly, and be able to go, you know, kind of a, uh, a run and gun type of a situation. We might, for example, be supporting the feds, and so we might need to, to install a fed radio. We don't want to be able to take, have to take apart a flush mount panel or you know, wiring harnesses that are just immovable. So we, we wanted the capability to be really flexible on a dime, very nimble, and be able to, uh, to change equipment or facilities based on mission. We have a redundant set of P25 uh, mobiles here and then we come back to a Harris radio, which is an EDAX radio that they use in Flagler County. A little bit farther back, we have a stack with a switch, two ICOM VEPG3s, which are the interoperability boxes, which Mike will explain how he's got those configured, as well as an IP1000C, and then a Gulfstream SIP server for a phone system. Hiding right behind it, the ICOM AP90, which is an access point, a Wi-Fi access point. This has some unique capabilities with some of the ICOM IP uh, branded product. But Mike, can you please explain how you have your switch and your VEPG3s uh, configured? Sure. So we have two VEPG3s on the bottom here. They're identical except the way that they're programmed. Each of these boxes supports four radio interfaces, so we have a total of eight that can be used simultaneously. They can be bridged all four radios on one of the VEPG3s, or they can bridge those uh, two different VEPG3 boxes. Everything is IP. Once it comes into the bridge controller, uh, for example, this 800 megahertz radio, comes into the bridge controller using analog, but immediately it does an analog to digital conversion. And everything after that is digital, unless you're going to another destination radio, in which case, of course, it does a digital to analog conversion. But that's what gives us the capability to do some rather unique things. Unlike most public safety systems, we can not only bridge between radios, which is important, because all public safety folks don't want to carry another radio. Their philosophy is, I want to carry the radio that I'm accustomed to, the one that I'm very familiar with. I've got spare batteries for it. I've got charges in my car, all of those things. They want to carry their own radio, and they want us as COMELs, uh, communication leaders or communication techs, to do all the background magic for them to be able to communicate to whatever destination they're trying to go to. Great example. 
we have situations where we might have a battalion chief that's using an 800 megahertz radio, and he might want to talk to an airband uh, radio for an out-of-area asset, like a helicopter. And he doesn't have a, a, an airband radio, a portable, so we can bridge them directly from a Harris EDAC system directly into airband using his own radio, he'll be able to talk to that helicopter, and vice versa, of course. So these two boxes basically give us the capability to bridge the radios, but what's unique is because it's all IP or digital on the back end, we can also have a radio talk to something like this, an IP phone. So these are grand stream phones, but it's kind of immaterial because the IP phone standards are very mature. So you can have IP phones from Grandstream, from Cisco, from Nortel, from virtually any, any manufacturer. And now I have the capability to be able to, from the phone, dial an extension, for example, uh, 903 or 902, and be able to go from the phone to the radio. So I have a phone to radio bridge now. But we extended that even further, and this is what's really catching the eye of public safety. With this Grandstream SIP server, or telephone server, a mini PBX, if you will, we're able to create three, up to three, conference bridges. So now, unlike most other solutions in public safety, we can bridge up to eight radios into one conference bridge and as many IP phones as we want into the same conference bridge. We can even bridge the satellite push-to-talk facility into that same conference bridge. So here's a scenario. Let's say Tallahassee is interested in the progress of a wildfire. Of course, Tallahassee is outside of our RF range for our 800 system. Tallahassee is about, let's call it 300 miles away. So how do they hear real-time what's going on within uh, our fire incident? Well, they can't, really. But now they can because they can be talking and, or listening on the satellite phone using push-to-talk. And we can bridge them into our Harris EDAC system. So now they've got situational awareness of what's going on at the fire scene without doing anything special using their, their satellite equipment. Uh, we also have uh, what we call IVR capability in this little uh, PBX or mini PBX in that if we had a, a regular LAN, landline, phone line, an RJ11 connection, if you will, we have two RJ11 connections on this box. And so you could dial it. It can even be connected, quite frankly, with the satellite phone. You can dial that, that number that goes to this box. It will answer and it will say, welcome to incident command, and the user can determine which radio extension that they want to go to as well. So let's say it's the, uh, the director of the Division of Emergency Management for the state of Florida. He could either come in through the satellite phone, he could dial a, an 800 number, for example, if we had it coming into this box, and he could gain immediate situational awareness in real time with no user intervention. Um, pretty powerful. At the very back, there's a couple of things that's unique. We have 100 amps of 12-volt power through uh, Astron Power Supplies, of course, quite heavy. We put them in a rack just so we have some stability. And then we got two things uh, back here, actually three things. We've got an SGC tuner. Uh, we, we've used that for eons and eons. And then we've got this satellite RF deck from Mitsubishi. But what's prominent here is uh, a TXRX repeater duplexer. So this is made for 600 kilohertz split, traditional uh, ham band, if you will, or ham split. However, in public safety, we don't use 600 kilohertz split. So we actually didn't need to use something as big as this. They typically use 1.5 meg or 1.2 meg splits on VHF. And then below that, we've got down here, we've got a 100 watt continuous duty VHF P25 repeater. And some people say, well, gosh, Mike, why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just put a UHF duplexer and a UHF uh, repeater? Because it's much, much smaller, of course. Well, again, everything we do is mission-driven. Florida Forestry Service is all VHF. 
If you go to California with their wildfires that they're having right now, CAL FIRE and the National Park Service, National Forest, they're all VHF. So it was prudent for us to, to install a VHF repeater because, again, that's the biggest risk that we have in our county. So VHF repeater, VHF cans, satellite, and tuner. Mike, I want to ask you a little more about this uh, bridging system that you've got here. All these radios are, well, I don't know that they're all analog. They're mostly analog, aren't they? Actually, it's a split. Uh, the two on this side that look identical, they're analog and P25, so P25 digital. On the other side, there's a, a matching pair, also VHF and UHF, and those are also analog and P25 digital. What we tried to do was because we never know where we're going to be deployed, we might have a P25 system where we're going, we might have an analog system, so we chose intentionally to install the highest level of technology that we could. Uh, these are P25 Phase 1 capable, for example. They're not trunking yet. Uh, but when, when we have those trunking radios available, we'll, we'll put them in as well. So essentially, you, though, you said go the highest level. So you're yes. coming out of all of these and going back in analog instead of digital audio. That's correct. So going into the controller, we're actually uh, going in and out as analog. But it's only analog for the six or so feet of cable between the radio and the bridging controller. And from a technology standpoint, there, there are four signals that we use. Very straightforward. Anybody, for example, who's done a, a two-meter repeater on the amateur side will be familiar with this. We take uh, trans transmit uh, audio. So um, we take it from, for example, the microphone audio. We take speaker audio. We take push to talk because we need to be able to key the radio. And then if the signal is available for COS or COR, we pull that as well. But a lot of radios don't have that signal readily available in the land mobile market. Some of the really higher end uh, ones might have an accessory plug where you can pull that, um, but most don't. So what's nice about this ICOM bridge controller is that if COS or COR are not available, it automatically looks for Vox. And because it's doing the digital conversion from analog, it buffers all the digital. So even Vox delays, we don't have the same kind of problems with Vox as we did in analog days. So doing it this way, you're coming in and coming out analog to communicate with the radio. So you could use any kind of radio you wanted to. You could bring something oddball and set it in here and be on the air with it just almost immediately then, huh? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And in fact, um, because I'm in the public safety um, business, volunteer primarily, but you know, as, as you saw here, we've got a Harris EDAX radio, but we also have a couple of Motorola XTL 5000s. They happen to be for 800 megahertz for P, uh, P25 phase one and phase two trunking. But if somebody walked in and said, hey, we've got a Tate radio, or a, another Harris radio, and we need you to use that because it's pre-programmed for our system, we would just pull those four signals from that radio, pull, pull it directly into the bridging controller. And what's nice is, unlike analog, we don't have to adjust levels, you know, transmit level or mic level and speaker level from the radio. We can do it all through a web page because it's all digital. Once it's done from analog to digital, then we can manipulate that signal for low cut, high cut, volume, uh, clipping, you know, all of that directly from a console. And then you can do the routing right here as to this radio needs to talk to this radio. And Yeah, that's correct. There's actually a couple of ways to do the routing. Uh, as we were talking about earlier, if you had a radio, let's say you were coming in VHF and you wanted to go out as um, 800 megahertz EDAX, to my trunking system. If you were coming in as a fire guy from Florida Forestry uh, and you had a full touch tone pad with um, you know, 12 keys, you could, for example, enter 904, which is the address for this Harris radio, directly from your keypad and you'll get a confirmation beep and then uh, you'll be able to transmit and you'll be heard on 800 megahertz EDAX. 
The alternative, because not all public safety radio users have a full keypad, is we can also initiate the bridge from our console. So when we deploy, we always have an operator here, 7 by 24. We usually operate in four or six hour shifts just to avoid fatigue. And they can initiate bridges of any type, one to one, one to many, many to many, whatever the, the mission calls for. Cool. That's, uh, that's a very interesting way of doing things. I'd, I guess this is the biggest MCOM van I've ever been in. And it is well outfitted here. Anything to anything. I, I like that idea. Well, and George, you know, we, we've seen much larger vehicles uh, before, but usually those larger vehicles have a conference room, has a big whiteboard. It's really m meant as an incident command post or command facility. Uh, for us, because we're radio guys, commercial, public safety, as well as ham, uh, what we thought was, and, and we got validated at APCO uh, the, earlier this week in Orlando, was that very few agencies have a purpose-built, mission-compatible vehicle that does only communications. And we are fully self-contained. In back of us, as, as you'll see on, on some of the, uh, the video, we have a 15 kilowatt diesel generator. It provides way more power than we need for this vehicle. At peak, we'll draw 2,600 watts just for this vehicle with everything on and everything transmitting at the same time. So we've got a surplus of well over 10 kilowatts. And the reason for that is because we've got a power distribution facility and extension cables, so we can power an entire incident command post. As soon as we arrive on scene, if they need power, boom, we're there. We've got it for them. Uh, everything's circuit breaker, GFCI protected, all of that. And then, of course, we have the mast in the back as well. And we were talking earlier about how the wires up here are not, well, some of them are, are laced up and in tubing here. Yeah. But more or less, you could get to any of these if you needed to quickly. That's right. But also, all these shelves you've got down here in cabinets stacked on both sides. You could fix almost anything or come up with any combination you needed to on right on uh, the spot, couldn't you? Yeah, and, and obviously, uh, George, you being an engineer, you recognize a lot of these, uh, the nomenclature. We carry, uh, normally, when we're not on mission deployment, we'll carry a pretty good supply of half-inch, half seven-eighths-inch Heliax connectors. We have all the tools for it. Uh, if we're on a deployment where we think that their trunking system, for example, on 800 megahertz might be compromised, of course, as you would imagine, most of the time it's going to be antennas and feed line as a, as a result of wind damage. So we actually carry 1 and 5 eighths inch connectors, uh, all the tools, all probably torquing tools. Uh, we have an Agilent um, N9330, so we can sweep everything from 30 megahertz to 4 gigahertz. We have Rody, Rody Schwartz spectrum analyzers with tracking generators, so we can tune duplexers in the field. Uh, if we needed, uh, for example, this VHF repeater to be on a totally different frequency, you know, most hams don't have this capability, but we're fortunate. We can tune any kind of filters in the field. Uh, we can reprogram the repeaters in terms of transmit receive frequencies, PLs, of course, in the field. That's not so uncommon. But tuning filters, tuning uh, multi-couplers, uh, transmit combiners, things like that, in the field uh, using equipment that we very routinely store on board. We also have uh, service monitors. So we've got a couple of IFR 1900s, a couple of IFR 500s. Uh, so we can repair stuff that's, you know, minimally or we can PM equipment as well. So we can, we've got GPS on board, so GPS synchronization, so we can tune a radio here on board if we need to as well. That is neat because occasionally you will need to do that, I, I assume. Oh, you bet. And we've had a situation where, you know, we didn't have a, a tornado or a hurricane, but we had a severe thunderstorm. And for example, we had a lightning damage to our tower top amplifier. And the tower top amplifier is at 425 feet. And it's not like you can just plug in your service monitor from the ground. So uh, we used our equipment, our Ag Agilent uh, 9330. We're able to sweep it and we're able, from the TDR function, uh, to be able to determine exactly what the failing component is so we could order the right resources to get it fixed as quickly as possible. 
Well, I see there's more gear here that I don't know what it is. So let's get Ray back around here and uh, y'all tell me what it what I am missing here that I don't know. Well, there's a lot I don't know, but <laughs> but these particular pieces that you've got here. Well, George, almost like on that long road trip, we're almost to the end. We're almost there. So we're now on the second side of the van looking at basically the storage areas for radio caches, whether it's portables, repeaters, SIP phones, spare coax runs, feed line, even your VHF, UHF bar to go up on top of the tower. All of that is set over here. But each of these radios are where you can deploy them and specific reasons why you've got those. Across the top here, we've got the ICOM IP radios, our P25 uh, VHF portables, uh, another brand of uh, portables to use here that Mike will cover with you, a couple of UHF repeaters, which can also be used as base stations as needed. Uh, Mike, I believe you're saying there's an amateur one, as well as your commercial battery conditioners, chargers for another brand, an 800 megahertz EDAX repeater. So I'm going to let you fill in the specifics on how you'd use them on a deployed mission. Okay, sure. So um, the Batwing, the one that Ray doesn't want to mention, is a Motorola gang charger, a typical Motorola six-way gang charger. What's in that one slot there is a, a Motorola Apex 7000, it's a dual band radio. 800 megahertz and VHF, which is very, very common in the public safety uh, disaster recovery community because many of the communities that we go to are 800 megahertz, and where they're not, more than often, more often than not, they're uh, VHF uh, capable. So we usually carry a couple of those um, Apex 7000s. Uh, we can also carry some of the older Motorola or charge some of the older Motorola very common that you'll st still see uh, XTS 5000s, XTS 3000 radios. So that, that is a conditioner charger. Here in the middle is, um, is ICOMS uh, 9021, 9011. So we've got two of the VHFs and one of the UHF and then some spare batteries as well. This is primarily for those guys that might have uh, no radio or might be deployed to us and not have any kind of radio at all. And let's say it's a fire situation. Uh, we know that most of the fire uh, operations are going to be on VHF. Some of them are going to be on 800. So we'll use this to uh, give them fire VHF capability. Then, of course, if they need to talk to Airband or if they need to talk to 800, we can always bridge them through the, uh, the ICOM bridge. These are the IP100 or the IP unlicensed uh, radios. We actually have these configured so that we have separate talk groups on these such that they can come out or come into, I should say, uh, any of the radios that we have defined. So you can use an unlicensed radio like this and you might be able to give it, for example, to a volunteer. And on one of the talk groups, they might have incident command or logis logistics section chief if they need supplies or whatever else. And these will tie through the access point that we showed earlier. And Mike, you were mentioning if you put it up on the mast, you get a, about a 600 meter coverage area. So if you do have people that need to have radios because they're not right next to each other, you can have these deployed to them and they have their own, as you mentioned, talk groups. But it doesn't tie up any of your tactical equipment, whether it's repeaters or even simplex handhelds. It, it's a real nice package that you can deploy. Yeah, that's right. And um, on, the, on the crossbar, which is down on the bottom, we typically have a UHF and a disc cone because the discount is so wide band, we use it primarily for 800. Uh, but underneath that, on the bottom of one of these, we'll invert an antenna that is 2.4 gig for ISM, specifically for these radios, as well as for our access point. Uh, so what that does is it gives an inverse cone uh, of an umbrella for roughly six to 600 to 1,000 meters of uh, Wi-Fi capability. But we don't do the Wi-Fi just for these, although it's important, obviously, because this only operates Wi-Fi. But as you recall, we talked about the ability to have a IP phone 
to be able to go into a radio or go into a conference group. Well, now, since I have Wi-Fi on board with an access point, I can enable my smartphone Wi-Fi to connect to uh, the SSID called ICP, Incident Command Post. And if I have a soft phone connected and downloaded, I can actually call from my phone, which typically a firefighter or a law enforcement officer, they'll only have two things, their normal radio and their phone. And almost all of them nowadays are smartphones. I can literally call from my smartphone using Wi-Fi directly to one of these phones or to the incident commander's phone or to the safety officer's phone. Or even better, I can go into a conference bridge which has radios and phones connected, including my phone. So we've got that capability, uh, which is pretty unusual. Uh, we, we've not run across anybody in the public safety sector that can do that so far. As Ray mentioned down here, the black boxes, there's three of them. Two of them are UHF repeaters for public safety. They're actually pre-programmed for all of what we call the UTAC or U UHF tactical frequencies. And then we also carry one for amateur. And some people say, well, why amateur? Well, very simple. Again, as we mentioned before, amateurs in a lot of cases, in a lot of incidences, uh, are, are eyes and ears in the field. Similarly, we can program these for GMRS frequencies as well. So now you got CERT teams that can be able to use their GMRS radios, and uh, we can put this on the top of a building or whatever the case is. These are AC as well as DC powerable. As Ray mentioned, uh, the, the IP phones, we're carrying eight of them right now. We can carry up to uh, 14 more, I believe it is, that we've got in our cache. Uh, but just for demonstration purposes, we only carried eight. Well, George, I think that pretty much ties up everything that we've got on the inside. I know you wanted to take a look at that tower and the generator out back, so we'll let you guys head on out there if we don't have rain outside. George, you're taking a good hard look at that hex beam up there along with the rotor. What do you think about that? I like it. I would like to have one myself. I like the crank up tower too. You know, I've worked with pneumatic masks before that were similar to this and they are a real pain because you have to kind of keep them lubricated and then that catches dust and sand and it seals leak. So uh, I like the idea of, uh, you know, the, the cable crank on this one. And I'm liking this antenna more and more, you know, as I see it and I learn that you select what bands you want on it. That's, that's important stuff. The other thing too, George, is uh, in an emergency situation, unlike uh, news gathering, where you've got the the Wilbert masts, for example, which are very expensive, you know, on the order of twenty thousand plus dollars. Uh, like you said, you got the high pressure hoses, you've got the seals, and everything else. The problem for us with something like that, and in fact, uh, a lot of agencies have said this, is what happens if something goes wrong with a seal or a hose or uh, an airline or whatever the case is in the field. We're there to support recovery capabilities. And so, for us, one of the mission criteria is reliability. And very few things beat a hand cable crank up, you know, the old Armstrong method, if you will, of cranking this thing up to 31 feet. The other thing with this uh, hex beam, George, that you, you can't really see by looking at it, is that the owner of Radio Waves is a former military guy. In fact, he does a lot of military contracts in addition to his ham radio line. And we were very attracted to that because what we wanted was not just an amateur antenna, which is very convenient for us, but we wanted an HF antenna that we could use on the federal shares network. Totally different frequencies. And he's in process of designing 
a, a, a totally different antenna, same concept as a hex beam, but with different wire lengths, different spacing, etc., so that we can operate uh, HF ALE to talk to the federal guys, or similarly, we have frequencies in low band for our county and with the state so that we can use a directional antenna. A lot of people will say, well, yeah, but the hex beam is only, let's call it 3.5 dB forward gain. Absolutely true, but you got 20 dB front to back. So that kind of isolation is huge because we want to get rid of the unwanted signals and just let pass and, and amplify, if possible, uh, the signals that we want. Now, one other thing, George, as you're painting across the top of that, you'll see it kind of looks like a porcupine, but there's three HF antennas on this vehicle besides the, the hex beam on top. He's got two verticals in the back. On the front of it is an AH-760, which is a uh, very rapid tune vertical antenna. And this configuration that Mike's got it on is the NVIS kit. So that makes it very beneficial in quick deployment. It's not only quick deployment, Ray, but for us, uh, typically within our Florida region, what we're wanting to talk to more so than anything else is the state EOC in Tallahassee. I don't know, call it 250 miles away. And NAVIS or NVIS is the ideal way for us to be able to do a cloud warmer and bounce right back down into Tallahassee as opposed to a straight vertical antenna which has a pretty low angle of radiation. In that particular case, we might actually skip right over Tallahassee, which you know obviously we don't want to do. Now, one of the other things as we're standing out here, George, you hear that beautiful purr from this generator? I just barely hear it. I'm using a Heil mic here. Walk <laughs> on over there and talk so, to So you. the front to back. So I'll come over here and I'll talk to you, George. And that should have raised up the noise floor just a little bit. But it's not hot to touch. It just chugs right along, and as Mike said, that's 12.5 continuous duty. Right. Mike, why did you go this route? A couple of reasons. Number one, uh, everything that you see, the vehicle itself, the tow-behind trailer, is diesel-powered. That was one of the mission criteria, because when we get into a situation, for example, like Hurricane Katrina, getting gasoline is really, really difficult couple of reasons. Number one, obviously the, the fuel stations, the gas stations, don't have power, so they're not able to pump. So our only source in those kind of situations is going to be the military or the airports. So we can get diesel from the military, especially if we're tasked to them or tasked in association with them. And the other side is we can go to an airport and if we can pump Jet A, we can run on Jet A for some limited period of time. We've actually run the generator on Jet A for about six hours. I wouldn't want to do it for very long because Jet A runs a little bit hotter, uh, so it's not necessarily the ideal fuel source for uh, a, a diesel engine, but in a pinch, you can do it, obviously. The other reason that we went to diesel is because the, the high flammability point, unlike gasoline, we're not now able to transport this on aircraft. So, for example, this has been transported on a C-130. And all the clearances and everything else, we, of course, have to take the antennas off. Uh, but we've actually transported it on a C-130. And because it's diesel, which C-130s transport vehicles all the time with diesel, uh, they don't have the same kind of fire danger or fire risk as a gasoline vehicle. All right, George, what do you think? I think it's mighty nice. Uh, I wish my mobile was this well equipped. I know what you mean. Mike, you've done an incredible job on the van. The agencies that you serve have got to be very proud to have someone like you as their comel to take care of them and make sure that all that critical communications happen. So at least from my point of view, thank you very much for the service that you give to everybody out there. And I really appreciate the time that you've put into this van. Well, thanks, Ray. Thanks, George, for uh, showcasing this. Uh, what, we, what we really hope is that it will spark some discussion, spark some ideas, ideas exchange amongst the amateur communities so that you can be more effective as you serve your served agencies, whether it's the Red Cross or Saturn for Salvation Army or for the Emergency Management Associations. So thank you.
All right, George. Well, Mike's got to get out of here, so. Yep. All right. We'll wrap up. Well, that's a wrap. <laughs>